Okay, thank you all very much for being here. Thank you so much, Jim, for uh, giving us the chance to talk about this. I am Jesse Shapiro. This is Liang. You will hear me call her Sophie. And uh, we are going to be talking to you today about linear uh, panel event studies. So let me first set the stage and say what I mean. Um, and of course, it will sharpen up as we go. So we're going to be imagining a situation today. We are we are interested in some units, I, so maybe US states, that we observe over some time periods, T, say years, and we want to study some outcome, Y, say employment, and there is some policy variable, Z, say the level of the minimum wage, and we are interested in learning the effect of the policy variable on the outcome. And we're going to be imagining that the, we, the researcher, are willing to specify some kind of linear panel model for the outcome. And that is something we will make more precise as we go. These kinds of methods are extremely widely used in empirical research. This is something that we um, produced based on data from a recent paper. Over a quarter of NBR working papers use this kind of method in one way or another, which is just a, a huge fraction. Um, and as you can see, it's been growing very quickly. Something else that I think is a really positive development is that this growth in empirical practice has brought with it a growth in methodological interest. And so this is just one manifestation of that. This is counts of related papers in the Journal of Econometrics. And you can see that is also exploding, although with something of a lag. So this is an area where the econometric theory literature has been coming in to try to fill in gaps in understanding that are being exposed by advances in empirical practice, which I regard as great. Um, this is also an area where plotting is not an incidental part of the methodological toolkit, but really an essential part of the toolkit. And this is a picture of the kind of plot that people, this is, I think, using made up data, but this is the kind of plot people will be very familiar with seeing in many research papers or producing in their own papers. And a quick count that we did suggests that the large majority of articles that are published that use these types of methods include something like this type of plot. So that is a theme that you will see us come back to repeatedly throughout the day. Um, there are lots of ways things can go wrong. Um, one of them is making plots that aren't very informative or potentially misleading. Another is in some way misspecifying one's model or one's identifying assumptions or misunderstanding maybe the goal of the exercise. But on the bright side, there are lots of resources for addressing these uh, uh, challenges, such as new resources for data visualization and new ways to assess sensitivity to various kinds of model misspecification. And so we are going to spend some time talking through those things today. And in particular, this will be the outline for today. I will give an overview, which I am almost done doing. And then Sophie will talk about issues around identification and estimation. I will come back to talk about making plots. Maybe we'll have a little break. Then uh, we will talk about some ways that things can go wrong and what we can do about those things. Uh, Sophie will talk about confounding and testing for pretrends. I will talk about uh, the popular subject of what happens when treatment effects are heterogeneous. And then uh, Sophie will wrap us up. Let me just give you a couple caveats. So one caveat, and this applies to me, not Sophie, is that I am not objective. Um, so I'm going to be giving you my take on you know, what you should do, and other people might uh, see it differently, and that's fine. But I'm going to do my best to try to distill what I think I have learned from uh, studying and working with these tools. And then this one, unfortunately, will apply to both of us. These lectures are not going to be fully comprehensive. We're not going to cover every facet. Um, and for sure, there will be people in the audience who have questions or things that they're interested in that we will not develop today. Um, the good news is that there have been a lot of really good um, uh, survey articles that folks have written, and we have links to a number of them in the slides. And the slides are on the NBR website as we speak, um, or at least they were when we started talking. So folks can go and click through and read those. And I'm not going to go through and read the titles, but this is all available for people uh, going forward. So with that, uh, we have completed the overview. And I will turn things over to Sophie to talk about identification and estimation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jesse, for the introduction. Um, I'm Liang San. You can also call me Sophie. Um, it's a great honor for me to be back in Cambridge and to present part of this method lecture. Um, so this module is titled Identification and um, Estimation. 
I will start with the simplest model of uh, linear panel event studies, which is the um, classical difference in difference estimator for two periods before and after and two groups uh, treatment and a control group. For uh, completeness, I will review the familiar assumptions um, that the DID estimator needs to estimate a causal effect, namely uh, no anticipation and power trans assumption. Um, after that, I will extend the classical DID estimator to the settings, firstly with multiple periods and then to multiple treatment groups um, that receive the treatment at uh, different times. Thank you. Um, as Jesse mentioned, we are building on our material of uh, several survey uh, papers. And for this module in particular, I'm also going to build on uh, classical references, such as uh, mostly harmless econometrics to uh, motivate the classical difference in difference estimator. So this is uh, roughly adapted from the 1994 paper by uh, David Card and Alan Kruger. Uh, the context is that uh, the state of New Jersey introduced an in increase in minimum wage in 1992 and uh, the authors were interested in estimating the uh, impact on, on unemployment. To do that, the authors collected uh, employment information for a representative sample of fast food restaurants, uh, not only in New Jersey, but also in the neighboring state of Pennsylvania. Um, so to mo motivate their DID estimation strategy, the author uh, wrote in the introduction, and I quote, since seasonal patterns of employment are similar in New Jersey and uh, Eastern Pennsylvania, um, their um, difference in difference estimation strategy uh, effectively differences out any seasonal employment patterns. So whatever is left is the causal effect of minimum wage increase on employment. Um, the author very clearly illustrated how this DID estimator is constructed in their uh, table three, which I uh, copy here. And uh, to help me describe this table, I'm going to introduce a couple more notations. So I will use the um, binary treatment um, indicator DI to differentiate between treated units and uh, control units. So since in linear panel event studies, treatment usually happen at a group level, here, um, all the restaurants in New Jersey are treated because they face the increase in minimum wage. And um, all the restaurants in Pennsylvania uh, belong to the control group or untreated. I'm going to use uh, minus one uh, to refer to the pre-treatment period and uh, zero to refer to the period when the treatment is actually implemented. So with this, I can describe the uh, four ingredients used for the DID estimator, which are the four sample average of the outcome, in this case, uh, employment before and after uh, and Pennsylvania versus uh, New Jersey, as shown here in this two by two uh, subtable. Now we can construct the DID estimate, which is shown here in the um, bottom right corner of their table, or formally it's the difference in the sample trends of, um, of the outcome in the treatment group and the control group, so New Jersey and um, Pennsylvania. And um, to discuss how this um, DID estimator uh, estimate the causal effect, I'm going to introduce the, follow the convention and introduce the concept of potential outcomes, here denoted to be uh, YIT of D, where D uh, belongs to either untreated or control um, and uh, treatment. So here the potential outcome says the employment that would have been if the minimum wage increased for uh, this fast food restaurant and uh, did not increase for this fast food restaurant. Now, um, using this uh, concept of potential outcomes, we can see what the observed outcome in the data set would uh, map to. So all the fast food restaurants in Pennsylvania are not treated, so their observed outcome would map to the potential untreated uh, outcome. For New Jersey, um, all the fast food restaurants, restaurants are treated and face the increase in minimum wage. So their observed outcome or observed employment would map to the uh, potential treated outcome. Now, in this uh, example, we are interested in the average impact for New Jersey after the minimum wage increased or uh, formal, formally, this is the average treatment effect on the treated as shown here, uh, written um, using the potential outcome notation on the slide. So let me unpack this expression a little bit. 
In the square bracket, we have the unit level treatment effect. So this is the difference between the potential treated outcome and potential untreated outcome for the same unit, the same restaurant. So this is telling us the um, change in the employment for this restaurant when the minimum wage increased. Um, for the restaurants in New Jersey, we already observed their potential outcome with the treatment. However, the uh, potential untreated outcome at the same time for the same uh, restaurant is actually not observed. So that's why this is usually referred to as the counterfactual outcome because that's never observed in the data. Now, if we take the um, average over the treatment effects within the treated group uh, within the New Jersey, then we uh, would uh, arrive at this average treatment effect on the treated. And uh, to estimate this quantity, since as I um, explained, the counterfactual outcome for New Jersey uh, is never observed, data alone is not going to get us anywhere to estimate this ATT. And we would have to introduce some uh, structure or assumption for us to make progress. So there are two uh, usual assumptions invoked here for the DID estimator to estimate the average treatment effect on the treated. The first one uh, is called no anticipation. So this assumption says the outcome is not affected by the treatment prior to its implementation. Um, in the example of a minimum wage study, this means the employment is not affected by whether this restaurant would eventually face the increase in, in minimum wage. Um, and assuming no anticipation, let me walk you through how this assumption can help us make progress. So as I mentioned, the observed outcome for uh, units in Pennsylvania, which is the control group, would all map to the potential untreated outcome for both periods. Without any assumptions, the observed outcome for the restaurants in New Jersey would map to the potential treated outcome. However, with this no anticipation assumption, since the uh, outcome is not affected by the treatment prior to, to the implementation, we can swap this um, um, potential treated outcome for the potential untreated outcome. So this top right corner is what the no anticipation assumption buys us. This is an assumption we made about the data, so of course we might wonder about potential violations, and in this example, a potential violation would be that the fast food restaurants started laying off minimum wage workers in anticipation of this increase in, in their wage. Other examples out in the uh, in the real world uh, would be, for example, uh, there could be consumption smoothing behavior in anticipation for a future job loss. The other assumption that's required for the DID estimator to estimate causal effect is the familiar uh, parallel trends assumption. And uh, this assumption says that the potential untreated outcome for the treatment group or the counterfactual trend in New Jersey would evolve in parallel with the potential untreated outcome for the control group or Pennsylvania. So this says in this example, if minimum wage never increased for New Jersey, the average trends in the employment would coincide between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Again, we need to think about uh, what potential violations uh, of this parallel trends assumption could be. So for the example uh, of minimum wage increase, that would be that there is a confounder, which is the local labor market demand. And if the local labor market was improving for New Jersey around the time of minimum wage, then we would see, uh, then we would probably guess that um, the uh, counterfactual trend for New Jersey would have already been on an upward trend compared to Pennsylvania. Other examples in the literature um, would include, for example, um, Ashen Felter's dip, which described the phenomenon that uh, participation in job training programs uh, would already be on a downward trend in wage income, and that is the reason they select into job training program. So this parallel trends assumption is an assumption that tries to connect the potential outcomes between the treated group and the control group. However, uh, this is still very different from the uh, unconfounded assumption that is usually invoked in on RCTs, which says there is random assignment such that the treatment assignment is independent of the potential outcomes. 
So firstly, um, if we are looking at a situation with random assignment, this is ruling out uh, any selection bias. And in that regard, uh, power trans assumption is different as it allows for potentially non-zero selection bias when we measure the selection bias in terms of the level difference, average level difference in the potential untreated outcome between the treatment group and the control group. And in particular, um, if we just manipulate the power trans assumption a little bit, moving terms from the left of the equation to the right of the equation, we would arrive at a um, stability of selection bias type of assumption, which says that we can have non-zero selection bias, but it has to stay the same in the pre-period uh, as the post-treatment period. So in that regard, parallel trans assumption is weaker, but it's stronger in different aspects. And uh, the important one is that the random assignment assumption or unconfounded assumption is invariant to scale. But on, um, on, in contrast, the parallel trans assumption is very dependent on the scale we're measuring the outcome at. So in the example of minimum wage study, if parallel trans assumption we think hold for the levels of employment, it might not hold for a log of employment and vice versa. Uh, in fact, recent work by John Roth and Pedro Santana showed that um, if we change the scale that we're measuring the outcome at, then uh, for the power trans assumption to always hold, we actually have to be in a setting that's very close to RCTs. Now that I have introduced the two um, assumptions, um, let me just quickly verify that the DID estimator is indeed a non-biased estimator for the average treatment effect on the treated. Um, so on the first line of this derivation, uh, I just have the, um, um, the, uh, the equality that uh, this DID estimator is unbiased for for the average um, expected, sorry, expected difference in trends between treated and uh, control group without any assumption. Now in the second line, um, I'm going to use the no anticipation assumption after I have mapped the observed outcome to their potential outcomes. And the no anticipation assumption uh, allowed me to swap the potential treated outcome for a potential untreated outcome here. Um, in the last line of this derivation, I use the subtract and add trick to introduce the potential treated outcome for the treated unit in the, um, in the post-treatment period so that we arrive at this average treatment effect on the treated. And uh, conveniently, the leftover terms here is assumed away by the Paolo trans assumption. So this is how we see the DID estimator is indeed an unbiased estimator for the ATT under the two assumptions we have laid out. So far, I've been talking about how to do DID by hand by taking the sample averages, but um, in practice, uh, we are usually implementing the DID estimator using regression. And uh, to do that, uh, let's define uh, ZIT as Jesse mentioned, uh, but just more concretely, this is a treatment status indicator that is equal to one if the unit I is treated and is also in the post-treatment period and zero otherwise. Then um, if we regress the outcome uh, variable on the group fixed effect and the time fixed effects, as well as this treatment status indicator, the regression coefficient beta um, would actually be numerically equivalent to the DID estimator that we have done by hand so far. And to see that, um, this is a two periods, two group situation. So this regression is uh, saturated. And um, based on the saturated precipitation, we can easily conclude that the regression coefficient estimator would be numerically equivalent to uh, the difference in the sample average, uh, sample average trends. This regression representation is also useful uh, when we don't have panel data sets. For example, if we have uh, repeated cross-section data, we can still implement the DID estimator and under the aforementioned assumptions, uh, arrive at an unbiased estimator for the ATT and so is the corresponding regression representation. We can also collapse the data set to group level and uh, run a group level regression uh, subject to correct weighting by group sizes, we can again recover the DID estimator. 
if we have panel data, um, how this is usually implemented in practice is to run um, what's known as commonly known as the two way fixed effects regression. So what's different from before is that I just swapped the group fixed effects for the unit fixed effects and everything else stay the same. Um, this two way fixed effects regression has been uh, fairly popular in the large subsequent literature uh, minimum wage and uh, have been adapted to allow for continuous treatment, covariates, multiple time periods, et cetera. Uh, we will return to some of these extensions uh, later, uh, but for now, let me focus on the extension to multiple time periods. First, I'm going to uh, extend to the setting um, with uh, multiple periods, but still just one treatment group and a control group. Uh, this might be helpful if we are interested in the effect of uh, the treatment on the longer horizon, for example, in this uh, Seattle minimum wage in, uh, study in 2022. In this case, let me use uh, T star to denote when the treatment is implemented for the treated group, and uh, we keep the same definition for the treatment status indicator ZIT as before, that's equal to one for a unit that's treated and also in the post-treatment period. Now, um, if we take the first difference of this treatment status indicator, delta ZIT, and uh, manipulate the time subscript a bit, then we can create a vector of relative time indicators. So to see that, uh, let's take uh, k equals to zero, then this would be an indicator for uh, contemporaneous treatment status change. And if we take k equal to uh, k being positive, then this would be an indicator for uh, the start of treatment uh, k periods ago, so it would be in the lagged period of the treatment. And uh, similarly, if we take here k to be negative, then this would be an indicator for uh, the treatment is going to start k periods in the future, so we are in the period leading up to the treatment. Um, the set of relative time indicators are very useful because we can use them to construct what's uh, commonly known as a dynamic specification. So compared to the uh, two-way fixed effect specification we saw just now, here I'm going to swap the treatment status indicator ZIT for this uh, relative time indicators. Um, and of course, if we put in all the possible um, relative time indicators, we will run into multicollinearity. So normalization is uh, necessary. And um, Jesse will talk more about the choice of normalization, but the convention is to normalize relative to the minus one period. And we can interpret um, the regression coefficient delta case associated with the other uh, relative time indicators as the normalized differences. Now, uh, with some algebra, we can still show the regression coefficient as est uh, estimator for these delta case uh, can still be thought of as a DID estimator uh, that tries to capture the average treatment effect K periods after the implementation of the treatment using the minus one period as the baseline period. So this provides a very nice bridge to the uh, to the two by two classical case we have uh, seen just now. Now, with multiple time periods, we would also need to generalize the no anticipation and parallel trans assumption appropriately to argue this um, regression coefficient estimator is estimating the causal effect. So the generalization for the no anticipation assumption um, is quite natural. It still says the treatment has no causal effect prior to its implementation. And um, for the parallel trans assumption, um, it just says that the uh, counterfactual outcome for the treatment group has to evolve in parallel with the uh, control group for all the time periods. Now, under no anticipation and parallel trans assumption, we can interpret the regression coefficient associated with the lagged uh, relative time indicators uh, as estimating these uh, cumulative average treatment effect on the treated. So this would be the impact of the minimum wage increase on employment uh, K periods after it's been introduced. There are also other implications by the uh, no anticipation and parallel trans assumptions in the setting of multiple time periods, which is that 
the regression coefficient associated with the lead indicators should all be zero. And this is the basis for the pre-trend testing that we will discuss later. Um, next, I'm going to, um, oops, sorry, uh, extend to the setting with multiple periods, but also multiple treatment groups. And um, this is also a common situation because policy interventions might be rolled out over time and minimum wage increase was introduced gradually across states. So for simplicity, suppose we want to estimate the impact of having experienced any increase in minimum wage, then uh, the setting would uh, map to what is now uh, commonly referred to as staggered adoption in the literature. So mathematically, what staggered adoption really means is that, recall we have this um, treatment status indicator, ZIT, um, under the stagger adoption setting, um, the ZIT has to be non-decreasing in, in the calendar time T. So once a unit is treated, it has to stay treated for the rest of the panel. This uh, simplification to stagger adoption is uh, useful because it allows us to categorize units uniquely into uh, treatment groups where the treatment timing is uh, referred to as uh, G of I here, where G stands for group, and uh, it's defined to be the earliest period at which the unit I has received the treatment. So uh, each treatment timing group or adoption group collects the units that started the treatment around at the same time. Uh, so here I just want to point out the convention in the literature is to use G of I equals to infinity to refer to the um, to the group of individual or units that never received the treatment. So this could be a little confusing, but that's just the convention in the literature. Um, now, uh, let me also generalize the uh, no anticipation assumption and the parallel trends assumption. Um, again, no anticipation assumption generalizes uh, rather naturally. Um, but here, the parallel trends assumption can have variations in terms of the generalization to stagger adoption. So the strong version would say that the uh, counterfactual outcome or the potential untreated outcome for all the adoption groups would, ha would have to evolve in parallel to the uh, never treated or control group. So this is a strong assumption because it uh, imposes parallel trends for all groups, including the never treated group and for all time periods. We can also think of a weaker version of the generalization, which is to only impose the parallel trends between um, the uh, among the adoption groups. So this might be useful in situations where we don't have a never treated group or the never treated group is actually very different from the groups that ever received the treatment. So um, the never treated uh, group had, the, had they existed may have evolved not in parallel uh, to the adoption groups, but that's irrelevant because we only require parallel trans assumption among the adoption groups. Now, suppose we um, continue to estimate the dynamic specification for the stack adoption with the normalization relative to the minus one period. Then uh, in addition to no anticipation and the parallel trans assumption, for a stagger adoption uh, setting. If we want to interpret these um, delta k's as estimate for the cumulative ATTs, here the specification also has a uh, homogeneity restrictions placed on the treatment effects. Um, to see that, uh, note here the regression coefficient, coefficient delta k's only depend on the relative time k, but not on the treatment timing group g. So this says the dynamic effects can only uh, vary uh, over time, but not across the adoption groups. We will return later to cases where the homogeneity uh, is violated. But for now, let's uh, proceed assuming homogeneity on the treatment effects. Then under no anticipation and parallel trends assumption, these uh, relative time coefficients delta k for the lagged indicators uh, are still estimating the cumulative ATTs, and we can take an average of these delta k's to uh, summarize the overall average treatment effect on the treated.
So another option that's uh, common in practice to uh, estimate this overall effect um, is to estimate what's usually known as a static model. So this is um, basically the same classification we saw at first in this module, where um, we only have the treatment status indicator as the regressor instead of the uh, relative time indicators. The regression coefficient associated with the treatment status indicator beta post in this staggered adoption setting is the correct summary for the overall effect if the specification is correct. Namely, the treatment effects are truly static and all the delta k's um, uh, stays constant for k greater and equal to zero. However, uh, if the treatment effects are not static, then this uh, model is misspecified. And uh, recent work has shown that in settings without a never treated group, so only adoption groups, there are cases where this static specification can have severe misspecification. Under severe misspecification, this coefficient beta post might not correspond to any proper averages of the dynamic effects delta case. And by that, uh, what I mean is that the beta post can be negative, even though all the dynamic effects are positive and vice versa. Uh, the 2022 paper by Clement de Chasmatan and Xavier Dafui and um, 2021 paper by Andrew Goodman Bacon have more details and proposed diagnostics for misspecification in this static model. As a concrete example, um, Clement and Xavier had an example of two adoption groups and uh, three time periods where we indeed have a positive and growing uh, dynamic treatment effects for both groups. If we uh, estimate the dynamic specification, we can correctly summarize the overall effect by taking a proper average of the uh, delta zero and delta ones here. However, if we only rely on the static model, we can sometimes be severely misled because in this example, when uh, these two groups are equal sized, uh, beta post would actually be equal to minus one half. So this provides a very strong argument for not relying only on the static model, which restricts the dynamics of the treatment effect to summarize the overall effect of the treatment. If we report estimates from both static and dynamic models, and they are quite similar, then um, we can combine these estimates into the single one while staying agnostic about the degree of misspecification in the static model. And this is based on a framework developed by an ongoing project uh, that I am working on with Tim Armstrong and Pat Klein. Um, now um, I have covered um, the common strategies under the no anticipation and power trans assumptions. In practice, we uh, might, always, might not always have uh, strong reasons to believe these assumptions are plausible or applicable. Then um, there are many proposals for alternative identifying assumptions proposed in, in the literature. And um, previous editions of methods lecture, including the inaugural one, has covered several of these, including changing changes, semi-parametric difference in differences and synthetic controls. And uh, for this module, I'm just going to mention a couple recent uh, variations and won't go into the details. So the first one um, is when we actually observe uh, cross-sectional data, but units can be categorized by their birth cohorts. Uh, sometimes we can still leverage cross-cohort comparison for example, the late birth cohorts in the treatment group are more exposed to the treatment than uh, individuals in the early birth cohorts. Intuitively, the birth cohort play the same role of calendar time, so we might expect many similarities uh, with the settings linear panel event studies, but still there are many differences as discussed in the 2017 paper by Clement Zavia. They propose alternative assumptions as well as estimators. Uh, the second variation I want to quickly mention is when the treatment is indeed randomized or the treatment timing is randomized. So for example, in RCTs, treatment is randomized, but we might observe past outcomes from um, baseline surveys. 
And another example is the treatment timing is randomized, even though other units eventually receive the treatment. So this is an example um, where the author studied um, uh, in a setting where the schedule of tax rebate is randomized. We can now rely on the random assignment assumption, which is invariant to scale. And recent papers by, uh, for example, David McKenzie and John Roth and Pedro Santana proposed estimators that would be more efficient than the DID estimators. Uh, with that, I'm going to conclude this module. These are the list of the papers that are the basis of, um, of this module. Um, and I will pause for questions and then turn to Jesse for the next module. Great, thank you very much. And we are now gonna talk about making plots. So I'm gonna start by just going back over some of the same material that Sophie covered, but in pictures. So graphically, the uh, and I should say, I should say this, I said this at the beginning, I'll say again, because I think this is important to emphasize. For this class of methods, plotting is not, in my opinion, an optional nice to have. It's an essential part of the methodological toolkit, and a plot like this should accompany every paper that is using this type of methodology. I'm not aware of a reason for there to be an exception, and increasingly there are few exceptions in the literature. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what these plots show, and then some. I will make some suggestions for how to make them as informative as possible for the people using the plot, which is usually the readers of your paper. So this is a plot that uh, uh, represents uh, the two group, two period setting that Sophie started with. So we have a before period, which we're denoting minus one. We have an after period, which we're denoting zero. And we have an average outcome for the control group and an average outcome for the treatment group. And the first uh, uh, complication that we might introduce this picture is we might have data that cover many periods. So Sophie talked about that. And so we get to a plot that looks like this. And this is a great kind of plot if you're in this situation. This plot is starting to get a little bit busy. Um, and because, as Sophie said, the idea, the underlying identifying assumption here or the underlying set of identifying assumptions imply constant selection, a common way to re-represent the data that makes a less busy plot that still captures in some sense a lot of the fundamental information would be to difference these two points. So take the vertical difference between the average outcome for the treatment group and the average outcome for the control group. And then I would get a plot looks like this, where now instead of the average outcome on the y-axis, I've got the difference in the average outcomes. Now again, the underlying notion here is relying on parallel trends. Parallel trends is, in some sense, always about relative changes. So we can't say anything about the absolute effect of the policy at a point in time without reference to a base period. That's the essence of the identifying assumption that Sophie described. So we, one way to kind of visualize that or remind ourselves of that on a plot like this is to normalize the plot relative to a base period. And a common choice of normalization, although it doesn't have to be the choice, is to normalize relative to the period immediately before the adoption of the policy or the treatment. And so if we do that, then we are uh, basically just putting a horizontal line that hits the y-axis at zero and goes through this point uh, uh, at minus one. And now we can read off immediately. I haven't put numbers here because this is a made up cartoon example. But if we had numbers, we could read off immediately the implied difference in differences estimate of the uh, instantaneous effect of the policy on the outcome just by looking at the y-axis. Okay, so what have we got here? What's the information that's captured in this plot? So we have one period where we're learning nothing. That's our normalization, right? We're basically saying we can't say anything about what's going on in that period because we had to throw out, we had to sacrifice that to go from unconfoundedness to parallel trends, that was the point that Sophie made. So we had to give up on that. So that's our normalized period. We have our pre-event periods that we might use for pre-trend testing. And here it doesn't look so great. Sophie will talk more about that. And then we have our dynamic treatment effects or dynamic policy effects. So these are the post-event effects. And you can see here as I visualize them, they're not all the same. So this is a situation where that static model wouldn't be a good description 
of the evolution of the difference in outcomes following the adoption of the policy. Now, one way to implement this plot, which is a common way, is to do it via regression. So again, I'll just to make this self-contained, go back over the notation just so we're on the same page. We're letting Z be an indicator. That's one if I is in the treated group is in a treated group and T is after the treatment date and zero otherwise. And then as Sophie said, we can make this picture by running a regression of the outcome Y on a unit fixed effect, alpha I, time fixed effect, gamma T, and there we're gonna allow for an error term epsilon. I won't talk very much about that. And then we have this big infinite sum of first differences because Z is an indicator, uh, you can think of these in a situation where there's only one treatment that turns on at only one time. You can think of these as just indicators for how for is there a change in the treatment status at K periods relative to period T, right? So that is, as Sophie said before, so if ZI T minus K is one, then that means that treatment started for this unit K periods ago, right? Um, and you can immediately see that this, this regression is oversaturated. So we won't be able to include the full set of these differences alongside these fixed effects. So we're gonna have, that's a regression interpretation of the fact that under parallel trends, we're going to need some form of normalization. And so again, a common way to do that is to normalize this coefficient at the period minus one right before treatment. So everything is in differences normalized relative to uh, that period. We can estimate this regression. We can plot its coefficients. That is a plot, if you remember, like your middle school representation of you Cartesian plotting, that's a plot of this object here. So we're going to plot the series that consists of these Ks and the associated delta hat Ks, right? And what picture are we going to get out? If we make that plot, we're going to get the same picture that we had before, because in the situation where we have many periods but only two groups, this is an equivalent way to accomplish the same task as before. Now, not all situations are as simple as this situation. So you might find that you're in a situation like the one Sophie talked about, where you have different units treated at different dates, like maybe the minimum wage increases in New Jersey at one time, and then later it increases in Pennsylvania. You might have a policy that's not binary, like the level of the minimum wage. Maybe you think that, you know, maybe minimum wages take many different values over your sample period, not just one or two, not just high and low. And so you may have a non-binary multi-valued treatment, or you may want to think of it as a continuously valued treatment. Or you might be in the unfortunate situation where you can't estimate an infinite sum, because like a lot of the data sets that I've been stuck with, your data set doesn't have an infinite number of periods in it, which is a super big bomber. So you might need to do something a little bit different. And one way to approach these situations, though it's not perfect and we will come back to why, is to just adapt that same regression model that I showed you before to this setting, okay? We can do that with very few changes, actually, um, because what I showed was just a regression. It didn't, running that regression didn't require anything about the structure of Z. The interpretation of the regression depends on the structure of Z, but the computation of the regression, pretty easy no matter what Z looks like. So just to go back over the objects that you're looking at here, what I am doing is I've got the unit fixed effect and the time fixed effect. And then I've made this sum have finite endpoints. So implicitly, I'm only including, gonna be including in my plot B periods before the policy kicks in and A periods after. And how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna include a variable that tells me the status of the treatment A periods before period T and the status of the, tree the treatment B period, B minus one periods after period T. Why are these the exact right ones to include? We can talk about that in the Q and A if you want. Um, and we have the algebra. I've cited a couple papers here that go through the algebra if you're interested. What this will uh, uh, allow me to do is have a plot that goes from B periods before the policy kicks in to A periods after the policy kicks in, where the periods at the end are now, in a sense, grouped effects because I'm making the dynamics finite. So this is basically a simple version of 
what you might think of as the modern event study plot. Um, and uh, uh, that name was adapted from pictures in finance that looked a little bit like this. So what we have here is uh, we have our two pre-event periods, except that now I put a plus to remind us that we've actually got a group of periods here. And we have our post-event periods, where again, I've put a plus to remind us that we've got uh, uh, more than one period represented here, and we have our normalization. Um, we have made a number of substantive decisions in going from the simple setting with the very general form of the plot to the more general setting with a somewhat more restrictive form of the plot. One important restriction that is a substantive restriction and is not innocent is that I'm assuming that the dynamics of the effect of the treatment on the outcome stabilize at a certain point so that I don't need to worry about what's going on more than B periods after the treatment effect. In my view, I mean, obviously that kind of assumption should be justified by economics, but I hope that something like that is reasonable because if it's possible for, treat, for things like the minimum wage to have arbitrary effects with massive and unknown lags, it's gonna be very difficult to learn what we need to know to decide what good policies look like. So that's, a, that's an assumption that I hope holds for the sake of all of us. Um, likewise, we're making a similar assumption in the other direction, that whatever pre-event dynamics there might be due to violations or par of parallel trends or violations of no anticipation, those dynamics somehow are gonna settle down at some point so that maybe people are not anticipating um, uh, the effect of the minimum wage 300 years in advance, or there's not differential selection based on what was going on 300 years ago. Um, and then, as I said before, but just to emphasize this, uh, we are always gonna be interpreting the dynamics here relative to some fixed normalization. We shouldn't forget that we can't say anything about absolute effects in some sense because we're using parallel trends for identification. I will also now warn you, and I will come back and flesh out why I'm warning you, that this is only one possible regression generalization of difference in differences. Um, I found it useful in applied research, and it has the virtue of being very flexible because it is something you can essentially always do. You need to make some decisions about those dynamics. You need to pick a normalization period, but subject to doing those things, you can always do this, even if your Z is a continuous variable or multi-valued, and no matter what your Y looks like. And so I think it's a helpful starting point for making a plot which in my experience is a helpful starting point for doing analysis and modeling and thinking about the economics of your setting. But it may not be the ending point and you may wanna do other things um, depending a little bit on the situation you find yourself in. And that is something we will uh, come back to in some detail. Because plots are a very important part of the toolkit, um, I will also make some suggestions for trying to make these plots convey as much information to the reader or user of the plot as possible. So let me go through a few um, recommendations that I will, would like to communicate. So here is our most basic plot, and I made it a little bit longer, so there's a little more going on. Um, so we have all the same elements as before. We have our you know seven periods and more ago indicator. We have our other pre-event periods. We have our post-event periods and we have our dynamics forced to settle down between uh, six periods and seven periods or after. And we're plotting our coefficients and we've normalized the coefficient at, at uh, uh, one period ago, one period before event time to uh, zero as a normalization, as I mentioned before. So the first thing we'd like to do to make this plot more helpful is to incorporate some kind of inferential information. So right now, if I told you the effect of this treatment in the first year was one, you might like to know, is that statistically significant? One way to make it easy to answer that question is to put pointwise confidence intervals on this plot. And because of the choice of normalization, these pointwise confidence intervals immediately allow us to test pointwise pre-specified hypotheses about particular event time effects. So if I wanna know, is the effect at time zero statistically distinguishable from the base period, I can answer that question by asking whether zero is contained in this pointwise confidence interval. And as long as I knew in the usual frequentist sense that that was the hypothesis I wanted to test, before I looked at the plot, 
everything will be totally fine. Sometimes I might like to test more complex hypotheses though. I might like to be able to test a hypothesis like, can I pass a line through the uh, coefficients, a flat line? Or is this represented by a quadratic or is there exponential decay or linear decay? And if I want to test hypotheses like that and I haven't pre-specified them, then I need to worry about the possibility of multiple hypothesis testing because I'm simultaneously testing hypotheses about many parameters at once and not just one of them. And this fortunately is a problem that has been studied a lot and it is possible to adjust the visualization in a simple way to make it possible to test such hypotheses by adding what are called uniform confidence bands. So in the same way that this confidence interval is designed to contain the true value of this coefficient 95% of the time, these confidence bands are designed to contain the true entire path of the event time coefficients, the full path of the delta k's 95% of the time. And they're quite easy to calculate you just need to do a little calculation to get a critical value. And they're obviously very easy to visualize because all you need to do is add these little end caps here or you know, whatever, you put little arrows or whatever you want um, to allow the uh, user of the plot to test any hypothesis they want about the path of the coefficients without having to do any further adjustment for multiple hypothesis testing. So that I think is an improvement to the informativeness or usability of the plot. I think it's also useful, and we'll talk a bunch more about this, or Sophie will, to make it possible for people to know whether the assumptions we made in building the plot are rejected. And some of the more important ones that I mentioned are the assumptions about the way that the dynamics stabilize at the ends. So um, one thing that I would suggest is to include a test of the equality of this coefficient and this coefficient that's the hypothesis. So the test of the hypothesis that this parameter is equal to that parameter, that's what I've called leveling off. And I've got a p value for that here. And then another hypothesis that is suggested by the assumptions of no anticipation and parallel trends is that all of the parameters, all of the coefficients prior to event time are zero. So the hypothesis that all of these here are zero, that is the hypothesis of no pretrends. And that hypothesis, I'm here I'm showing the p-value right on the plot. So that seems like maybe a useful thing to label somewhere on the plot, although there are caveats with interpreting that that Sophie will um, come back to in the next bit of the uh, series. Um, the last thing that I think lots of folks use these plots for, and part of why I think they've become so essential is because this plot helps us to ground our beliefs or intuitions about whether or to what extent we find confounding of one kind or another a plausible explanation for the patterns in the data. So do we believe that there's really a causal effect of the policy or do we believe that there's something else going on, a third factor that is related to the policy or the timing of the policy and is related to the outcome? And so if I showed you a plot like this and said, this is my estimate of the effect of the minimum wage on employment, you might be reassured that, you know, for the most part, we can't rule out that there's a pretrend here through the, at least through the uniform bands. And you might conclude that the minimum wage is great for employment, and that could be right. But you might also be thinking that it's possible that there is another factor, like the state of the economy, that is, you know, moving along and maybe legislators at state levels don't increase the minimum wage when the economy is in recession, so they tend to increase it when times are good. And so you might believe that there is a slow moving confound that is uh, instead explaining this pattern. One way that you can use the plot to ask questions about that is to ask whether, for example, a line is statistically consistent with these estimates. There's so one way to do that without any help from any software is just to take your finger and ask whether you can fit a straight line through the plot. I, don't, I can't put my finger on Zoom. So for those of you at home, you can imagine that I'm doing that. Um, and that's fine. That will work. Another way to do it is to ask whether a line is inside the walled region. That is, can an F test reject that all the coefficients lie on a line? And that's also very easy to do. Helpful to have a computer for that one. You need a little more than a finger, but it's not that big of a deal. So you could ask, does a line fit inside the walled region? And if you thought that one did, and you were in an economic situation, which you know you may or may not be, where you thought that this is what the dynamics of confounding might look like, then that might make you worry. 
On the other hand, if that's the sort of situation you're in, if you think that confounds look sort of smooth and you see something like this, you might say, well, I don't think I can fit a line through this uh, plot. And indeed, this is an example we cooked up where the line is rejected by the F test. that's not in the walled region. So maybe you would find it more plausible that there's really a causal effect. Although again, that's something you would have to evaluate context by context, depending on what kinds of confounds you think are reasonable. So one suggestion that some co-authors and I have made is to automate this visual process by asking, what is the least wiggly path that you can fit through the walled region. So what is the least wiggly path that is not rejected by an F test? And we spent a great deal of time and ink on formalizing what wiggliness means in this setting. And I will not, uh, uh, unless folks ask about it in the q and I will not belabor that now. Um, but uh, uh, I will say that that is a suggestion that we have made. And to make that suggestion and other suggestions that I have made to you today easy for you to adopt right out of the box, in your empirical research, we have made some software available, a package called XT event in Stata, and another package called event study R in R that implement all of these plotting suggestions automatically. So the idea would be that uh, to make your plots more informative, um, you can let the software do a bunch of the work and get um, some of these additional uh, pieces of information onto your plots so that your readers can make uh, more informed uh, evaluations of your uh, uh, estimates. Thank you very much. Uh, great. Thank you so much for um, staying for the second half and to all of you in person, also on Zoom. Um, so I will present this module titled uh, Confounds and uh, Pre-Trend Testing. Oh. oh, this works. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so as we have discussed, uh, the difference in difference estimators and related methods would rely on a no anticipation assumption and a parallel trends assumption to identify causal effects. But in practice, we are often not sure if these assumptions hold. So this module, um, I'm going to discuss the common practice of using the pre-trend tests to test these assumptions. Uh, these pre-trend tests is usually interpreted as a test for the parallel trends assumption. So I will discuss the role of the no anticipation assumption in these tests and also cover several uh, challenges in implementing these pre-trend tests that has been investigated in recent literature. Um, I will also discuss several solutions to the uh, to these challenges. But first, before delving into the details, uh, let me first cover the basis of the pre-trend test. So in the classical example, uh, where we only have two periods before and after and two group, one treatment and control group, the model is just identified. And by that, I mean um, under the no anticipation and power trends assumptions, there is only one way to identify the average treatment effect on the treated based on the data. And in fact, this is the basis of the GID estimator. At, after we do this, there is no additional restrictions left from these assumptions that we can use data to test. Things become uh, different after we have multiple periods, even with, with just two, period, uh, two groups. So in this case, uh, we can estimate this dynamic pacification with appropriate normalization. And um, under the no anticipation and the parallel trends assumption, we can um, interpret the uh, regression coefficient associated with the lag indicators as the uh, estimator for the cumulative average treatment effect on the treated. After that, there are still additional restrictions left from these assumptions in the sense that the regression coefficient associated with the lead indicators should all be zero. So now we actually have additional restri restrictions that we can use to uh, use data to test. And this is the basis for uh, what's usually known as the pre-trend test that tests whether we have a zero pre-trend that all the pre-treatment uh, regression coefficients are jointly equal to zero. So this test is usually interpreted as a test for the parallel trends assumption. And uh, next, I'm just going to quickly discuss what, what is the role of the no anticipation assumption in these tests. And to, to do that, I'm going to go over a series of graphical illustration. So on this graph, uh, we observe two groups, a treatment and a control group. 
And um, we are plotting their average outcomes over time where the treatment received the treatment, treatment group received the treatment at time zero. Here we do see a diverging trends between their outcomes leading up to the treatment between the two groups. And if we conduct a pre-trained test, very likely we're going to reject it. And we might uh, interpret this rejection as some failure of the uh, parallel trends assumption. But when we make this conclusion, what we're really thinking is that the observed uh, pre-trend in the treatment group matches with what the counterfactual outcome would have looked like for this treatment group, as shown here in the purple dashed line. So if this um, pre-trend, um, this confounding trend continues onward to the post-treatment period, this would have implied a confounding effect that would bias our post-treatment effect estimate. However, um, the same data is actually consistent with a totally different story. And in this story, um, parallel trans assumption actually holds because it could well, very well be that the counterfactual outcome for the treatment group is involving in parallel, as shown here in the purple dashed line, between the treatment and the control group. The divergence we are seeing uh, leading up to the treatment between the treatment and control group is entirely due to the anticipatory effect. And this is very likely to uh, happen in several um, empirical settings depending on your application. But conceptually, I want to emphasize that violations of the no anticipation and parallel trans assumptions are distinct. So anticipatory effect happens because the treatment has a causal effect prior to its, its implementation. And this anticipatory effect might be very interesting to learn on its own. Um, on, on the other hand, the non parallel trends happen uh, probably because there is a confounder around the time of the implementation of the treatment, such that this confounder is causing a confounding trend, so that we do see a divergent trend between treatment and the control group leading up to the treatment, and we might believe this confounding trend would continue onward and bias our post-treatment effect estimate. The challenge here is that observationally, uh, violations of these two assumptions are not distinct, as I have shown you here using graphical illustration, that both scenarios are plausible interpretation for this rejection. So this means whenever we have a re rejection of the pre-trained test, we would want to have a careful interpretation for this rejection based on the setting you're working with, whether this is because of anticipatory effect and parallel trans assumption hold, or it's because uh, there's no anticipation and all we are observing is a violation to the parallel trans assumption. So now I'm going to uh, delve into uh, details of several challenges that recent literature have investigated in implementing the pre-trained test. So as a reminder, uh, to implement the pre-trained test, uh, we first estimate this dynamic pacification, uh, collect the uh, pre-treatment coefficient into a long uh, vector, now call it delta pre, and test whether these pre-trained coefficients uh, are jointly equal to zero. So recent work has pointed out that when we interpret these pre-trained tests as a test for the parallel trans assumption, so assuming a way anticipation for now, these tests actually can fail to uh, detect violations of parallel trans assumptions. So uh, again, I'm going to use a series of graphical illustrations um, uh, based on the 2022 paper by John Roth. So here is a pop quiz to see if we follow John, uh, Jesse's module closely. Um, I have a event study plot here with the uh, regression coefficients associated with the relative time indicators uh, attaching confidence interval or uniform confidence bands. And the question is that, uh, can we reject the power trends assumption, assuming no anticipation for now, based on the pre-trend test in this event study? If we follow Jesse's module, the answer is, at least from the statistical sense, the answer is not sure. So it's true that we cannot reject the null hypothesis of zero pre-trend. So that is to say, if we test the pre-trend coefficients are jointly equal to zero as highlighted here on the green triangles, 
we cannot reject the Snell hypothesis. However, this, um, these coefficient estimates carry very wide confidence interval, and um, it's a very noisy zero pretrend. So uh, if we just look at a neighboring uh, null hypothesis as highlighted here in the red squares, we also cannot reject this uh, null hypothesis. So the reason I'm um, picking these particular set of hypothesis the value for the uh, for the pretrend here is that if we draw a line through these uh, red squares, um, they can uh, be they, and assume a linear extrapolation. This uh, pretrend in the pretreatment period can extend beyond the post-treatment period and imply a, a large uh, confounding effect that would uh, explain a large share of the estimated treatment effect and uh, would be evidence for bias in our treatment effect estimate. So um, in this case, um, this is the issue of a low power test, even though we cannot reject a zero pretrend, which is nice, but uh, we also cannot reject a pretrend that under this linear extrapolation, which is very reasonable, would produce substantial bias in the post-treatment period. So as always, it's uh, dangerous to rely on a low powered uh, test to draw conclusions. Unfortunately, um, this issue of low power isn't uh, pathological that's being cooked up by uh, econometricians. Um, in the simulation calibrated to papers published in recent AA journals, uh, John Roth in this paper found that uh, many tests have limited power against reasonable alternatives. For example, the linear confounding trends I described just now. The good news is that we can uh, evaluate the power for the pretrend test in any given application uh, using software packages kindly provided by the author. And um, if the power for reasonable alternatives is too low, then we might feel skepti skeptical whether the power trend assumption actually holds, even though we cannot reject zero pretrend, because this might just be a noisy zero pretrend. So the second challenge um, is related to this first challenge about the low power of these pretrend tests, and actually comes from a um, very reasonable question, which is that if we report estimates only if we pass the pretrend test, can this improve the post-treatment effect estimator? So at first, we might think this is always a good idea to do because effectively we're using the pretrend test as a screening device, hoping to screen out the situations with a confounding trend. However, when the power uh, of these pretrend tests is low, uh, there can be unintended consequences because the estimates for the pretrend coefficients are usually correlated with the estimates for the post-treatment effects. So that means uh, when there is indeed a confounding trend, so all the pretrend coefficients are not zero, if we condition on um, passing the pretrend test, which would happen quite often if we have a low power pretrend, um, then effectively we are looking at the subsamples where the estimated pretrend are small enough and close to zero. And um, due to the correlation between the pretrend estimates and the treatment effect estimates, this would affect the original asymptotic normal approximation for the post-treatment effect estimates and distort uh, the inference. So to illustrate this, I'm going to show you a very quick simulation study. So on the left-hand side, um, this is a situation where uh, we have an upward confounding trend and uh, zero treatment effect. So uh, the estimates for the pretrend and the estimates for the treatment effect are going to be uh, centered around non-zero values across samples. Now, suppose I'm going to screen based on whether I pass the pretrend test. Uh, this is a low power test, so 50% of the time I'm going to get lucky and actually pass the pretrend test. So if we only focus on the subsample where I pass the pretrend test, we're going to be in the situation on the right-hand side where the uh, positive correlation between the pretrend estimates and the post-treatment effect estimates would mean the distribution of the post-treatment effect estimates also got shifted up. 
So um, on average, uh, if we look at the post-treatment effect estimates in the sub in the selected subsample, we are going to on average have a larger bias than before without screening. And um, this is a general phenomenon known in econometrics as uh, pretest bias, which says uh, if we screen based on a preliminary test and then decide whether we're going to report the estimates for the treatment effect, usually this can exacerbate the bias. Again, this is not a pathological case. The same simulations, uh, calibrated simulations, suggest that screening in many empirical relevant settings can induce large bias that can be similar in magnitude to the estimated effect. So here the solution is actually relatively simple when the power of the pre-trained test is low, uh, it's not a good idea to draw conclusions based on the pre-trained test. We would only want to emphasize these pre-trained tests when they have a, a good power for reasonable alternatives. Uh, the final challenge I'm going to talk about for these pre-trained tests is quite subtle and only happens when we um, only have ever treated groups, so no never treated groups. And uh, I'm going to go through a series of graphical illustration first and then give you a bit more theoretical details for why this happened. So this is the issue that we cannot detect a linear violations to the identifying assumptions, namely no anticipation and parallel trends uh, with only uh, ever treated groups. And on this figure, I have a early adoption group that uh, is treated at time zero and a late adoption group that's treated at time one. So this data uh, as plotted is consistent with no violations to both assumptions because uh, the counterfactual outcomes for both groups may have well been uh, evolved in parallel as shown in the purple dash line and there is also no anticipation. Um, however, uh, as pointed out in um, the uh, paper by Kirill Borusiak, um, Xavier Jahavel, and Jan Spies, as well as in the earlier version of their paper, the same data set could be consistent with the linear violations, especially to the no anticipation assumption, because um, it's also plausible that the counterfactual outcomes for both the early adoption group and the late adoption group would evolve as shown here in the purple dash line. And that we're seeing the uh, upward trend for both groups is in fact due to anticipation effect. How this uh, issue is manifested in practice is that, as pointed out by the authors, if we estimate a dynamic specification and uh, without a control group and include all the possible relative time indicators subject to the normalization, uh, to, for example, the minus one period, there is still a multicollinearity between the relative time indicators and the calendar time indicators due to the linear relationship between the uh, calendar time and the uh, initial treatment timing. So um, this multicollinearity would mean that it might well be the situation where uh, in this figure, it's only positive calendar time fix effects and no uh, treatment effect or no anticipation. So um, uh, non-zero time effects, but delta k is equal to zero. But it could also be the situation where there is no calendar time effect and only uh, non-zero treatment effect and anticipation effect. But the data alone cannot tell these two situations apart um, and to make progress to detect these violations, we would have to introduce some restrictions about the data first and then test the remaining restrictions implied by the assumptions. Um, and the reason this point is worth emphasizing is that if we estimate the dynamic specifications in common uh, software packages, um, the collinear regressors tend to be directed uh, directly omitted without being reported, so it would be good to check whether the ones omitted are uh, compatible with the restrictions we want to impose on the data, because we don't want the software to uh, implicitly determine what are the identifying assumptions should be for us. 
The solution to this uh, issue uh, is actually to just make a conscious decision about the additional restriction on the data, which would take in form of additional normalization in addition to the, uh, for example, the minus one period. Uh, and in terms of what are the reasonable uh, normalizations, this would of course depend on your applications. But for example, uh, we can normalize at least another distant lead so this would mean uh, we are assuming no anticipation and parallel trans assumptions to hold at least between two periods uh, for each group. In the plotting session that uh, Jesse presented, we also made the suggestion of um, imposing dynamics are stable for more than B periods before the event and um, A periods after. Uh, so these are the uh, challenges that have been investigated in recent literature. And uh, next, I'm going to talk about some solutions under potential violations to uh, parallel trends, which would be handy if, for example, we have a low-powered pre-trend test. So um, the first uh, solution uh, is based on uh, sensitivity analysis and um, the motivation is that a non-zero pre-trend can be informative about the violations to the parallel trans assumption in the post-treatment period, since we usually think the confounding trend would evolve in a smooth manner. So the estimates for the pre-trend would provide information on the amount of bias in the post-treatment effect estimate, how much of it is actually due to confounding, not due to the treatment effect. Uh, this has already been done um, in practice, sometimes not called uh, sensitivity analysis uh, explicitly. So, for example, uh, empirical papers often uh, informally extrapolate the pre-trends by assuming the, um, the confounding trend has to evolve linearly. So this would be controlling for a linear in uh, relative time um, added to the dynamic pacification. But sometimes we might not want to impose the exact uh, linear extrapolation from the pre-trends to the confounding trend in the post periods. And to relax the exact extrapolation, uh, recent papers by Chuck Mansky, John Pepper, Ashash Rambashan, and John Roth, they have uh, proposed uh, sensitivity analysis. And uh, to illustrate this approach, I'm going to borrow a figure from Ashash and John. So, here, uh, if we impose a exact linear extrapolation of what the confounding trend would look like in the post period, that would be based on this um, dashed uh, blue line. And if we subtract this um, uh, confounding trend um, off the estimated post treatment effect, we debias the treatment effect estimate. However, this linear uh, exact linear extrapolation might be too uh, uh, too stringent. So uh, Ashash and Zhang consider bounding on how far the confounding trend in the post period can deviate from a exact linear extrapolation. So the confounding trend in the post period can fall into this uh, blue region. Then if we subtract off all the possible values of the confounding effect in the post periods, then we get a set of values uh, that are debiased values of the treatment effects. And the paper has more details and uh, construct the confidence sets for the treatment effect with the correct coverage under the assumed bound. Uh, for example, um, as shown here on the figure, and also takes into account of the estimation error. And they're all uh, implemented uh, in uh, statistical software packages provided by the authors. The second uh, solution that I'm going to talk about uh, is able to produce a point estimate, and it's based on the proxy uh, instrumental variable approach. And um, this approach would need uh, additional data, but I'm going to argue that the additional data is often available in practice. So the premise for this approach is that um, sometimes we actually know the cause of the confounding trend. In the example of minimum wage study, uh, the local labor market is the confounder, and that could, uh, if it's improving, it could uh, imply that the confounding trend um, is uh, upward sloping when we are trying to estimate the impact of minimum wage increase on youth employment. 
The challenge, of course, is that we don't observe the confounder. Otherwise, we can directly control for it in our dynamic specification. Um, but oftentimes, in, in, in applications, we do observe a noisy measure for the confounder. So in the example of estimating the minimum wage increase on youth employment, uh, a candidate for this noisy measure is the employment in the prime age group which is also affected by the local labor market, uh, but not so much affected by the increase in minimum wage. Recognizing that we often have access to these noisy measures for the confounders uh, in this 2019 paper by uh, Simon Freyaldenhofen, Christian Hansen, and Jesse Shapiro, uh, they argue that under some conditions, the leads of the instruments can be uh, the leads of the treatment, sorry, can be used as instruments for the noisy proxy to uh, when, when the noisy proxy are included as control variables in the dynamic classifications. So using the uh, treatment as instruments can uh, correctly remove the bias due to the confounding effect in the post-treatment periods for the main outcome of interest. And this is also implemented in uh, software packages um, so uh, I'm going to go through a series of uh, figures to illustrate how this method would work. But um, before that, I'm just going to make a note, and this is also to a question from uh, the first half, which is that if we only include these noisy proxies as a control variable in the dynamic specification, but don't do the instrumental variable correction, this is not enough to remove the bias due to confounding because um, these are noisy proxy for the confounder, not the confounder itself. So how this uh, proxy instrumental variable method works is that let's start with the event study plot for the main outcome of interest, say uh, youth employment in response to minimum wage increase. Here we do see a significant um, post-treatment effect estimates, but the bad news is that we also see a significant upward uh, pre-trend. So we might worry that um, the post-treatment effect estimates might be due to some confounding effect, not due to the treatment effect of minimum wage increase. Uh, if we plot the event study for the uh, noisy proxy uh, as well, so for example, the employment in prime age group, we also see a similar pre-trend dynamics. And that's because this noisy proxy is affected by the same confounder as the main outcome. However, this is a noisy measure for the confounders, so uh, we don't want to only control for the uh, covariates in the, uh, in the dynamic classification. What we should do is to use the instrumental variable, which are the leads of, in, of the treatment, to rescale the dynamics of the noisy proxy here to match with the dynamics in the, in the main outcome of interest, as shown here in the orange triangles. Once we do this uh, rescaling, and since the proxy, noisy proxy is not affected by the treatment, the post-treatment periods would carry the dynamics that are reflective of what the confounding effect would have looked like for the main outcome of interest, which are shown here in the orange uh, triangles. So now uh, subtracting off these rescaled uh, noisy proxy of the original uh, treatment effect estimates for the main outcome of interest, as shown here in the bottom right figure, we would get estimates for the treatment effect that are adjusted for the confounding effect. Uh, so with that, let me uh, conclude. And uh, again, this is the list of all the papers that are the basis of our uh, module uh, in case you're interested in more details. And I'll pause here for questions before Jesse takes over. So now I'll get out of my own way and continue the, uh, the, with the next module. Um, I'm gonna be talking about situations where there are heterogeneous effects of the policy on the outcome. So for the purpose of this module, I'm going to consider a situation where we're now, I'm gonna set aside the things that Sophie was just talking about. That is, we, we may be worried that there's a confounder so the parallel trends does not hold or that there's anticipatory effects. I'm gonna set those aside and suppose that we really believe we're in a situation with no anticipation and parallel trends. But I'm gonna allow that the policy we're interested in might affect 
different units differently. So for example, it might be that you know, if you're a less productive firm, then the minimum wage is a bigger deal than if you're a more productive firm, you have made less room to, you know, for employment because maybe you have less room to, to, to increase wages. So uh, lots of economic situations are going to exhibit that type of heterogeneity. And of course, that's been a huge theme of econometrics and in, in over going back many, many decades. Um, I'm going to talk today about what some of the implications that that type of heterogeneity has in the sorts of settings that we are interested in. And in particular, I'll talk about what it means for identification, what can we learn, hope to learn from the data, and then also what does it mean for estimation, what happens if you use an estimator that um, is not correctly specified or is based on an incorrectly specified model, but in fact, um, that, that, that assumes there's no heterogeneity, but in fact there is. And then I will talk about some very practical, easy to adopt solutions that apply in certain situations and say a little bit about situations where there are fewer off-the-shelf solutions. So let's go back to the beginning and imagine again that we have one event, okay? And we have a treatment group and a control group. So we have an affected group and an unaffected group, just like the very beginning where Sophie started. What problems does it cause if under the hood of this average, some of the treatment units are more affected than others? So in our minimum wage example, what kinds of issues does, does arise if some restaurants have a larger employment effect of the minimum wage than other restaurants? And the answer is it doesn't cause any problem at all because nothing that Sophie assumed ruled out the possibility that the difference between the factual and counterfactual employment for restaurants in New Jersey was the same across all restaurants. That was, that was not an assumption that Sophie made. And it, she didn't make that assumption because we don't need that assumption. So if we have, and I'm representing this just very loosely by these dashed lines here, we envision that there's some underlying heterogeneity around this average. So this is not a confidence interval now, this is just a way to visualize where there's heterogeneity. We're not gonna run into any problems. Everything that uh, Sophie said would be true. And we know that because Sophie did not articulate any assumptions that preclude this possibility. So that's great. So if we have no anticipation and we have parallel trends, we can have all kinds of heterogeneity in how the treatment affects the, the treated units. And we don't have to worry about that at all if we're interested in average effects. Great. Okay. So with one event and a control group, heterogeneous effects, no problem, nothing that we've said so far, nothing that Sophie said rules that out or is complicated in any way by that. Now I'm gonna start thinking about richer settings. And in particular, let's go to the static adoption setting and I'll go to the simplest possible static adoption setting, or sorry, staggered adoption setting, where we have an early adopter and a late adopter. Okay, so we have uh, no pure control, no unaffected group, just an early adopting group and a late adopting group. Okay. What happens if we try to learn the effect of the treatment on the early adopter in the first period of adoption? Can we do that? Yes, that is exactly the same as the situation before because under no anticipation, the fact that there's going to be an adoption later for the late adopting group is irrelevant. Under parallel trends, we can use the late adopting group as a counterfactual for the early adopting group. So everything that we said before that Sophie said in the first part of the series, talking about the classic difference and differences setting applies immediately without alteration to learning the effect of adoption on the early adopting cohort or early adopting group in the first period of adoption. Okay, so far so good. What if we are further prepared to maintain, so here we haven't said anything about dynamics because there's only one period. What if we are prepared to maintain that the effects are static in the sense that whatever is going to happen as a result of treatment to the early adopting group is done after one period. So if the minimum wage affects employment, that effect kicks in after one year. And if we look at subsequent years, we're not going to see any further dynamic effects of the policy. It, it just it's one and done, right? The policy has an immediate effect, and that is the full uh, uh, dynamic effect of the policy. Well, in that case, we can just repeat that same logic to learn the effect of the policy on the late adopting group. Why? Because the early adopting group goes back to a trend that reflects only the underlying effects of calendar time. There's no longer any dynamic effect of the policy on that group. And so this group allows us to form a counterfactual for what would have happened in this group had there not been an adoption. 
And so now we've learned the effect of adoption on the early adopters, and we've learned the effect of adoption on the late adopters, each in the first period following adoption. But that's all there is to learn because there is no dynamic effect. So there's no effect of the, on the early adopters in the second period. And if we want to average them, we can average them. Or if we want to weighted average them, we can weighted average them. And we can decide how we want to aggregate those into a single number. Okay, and the reason is that the early adopters here are providing our counterfactual for the late adopters. So to summarize, in this situation, for the early adopters, the late adopters under our maintained assumptions are a valid control for the effect in the first period after adoption. If the trends between the early adopters and the late adopters diverge, it has to be because of the effect of adoption on the early adopters. That's what our assumptions tell us. For the late adopters, the early adopters are also a valid control for the effect in the first period after adoption, because if the trends diverge, since the policy is no longer having any effect on the trend in the early adopters, it has to be because of the effect of the policy on the late adopters under parallel trends. And so everything is still very simple. We can estimate anything we want. We can take averages if we like to take averages, and uh, there is no uh, super big problem. Okay. Now I'm just going to change. I think just one word in the title of the slide. I'm going to go from heterogeneous static effects to heterogeneous dynamic effects. So in this situation, we're still fine in the first period because we can use the late adopters as a control for what would have happened to the early adopters had they not adopted. But unfortunately, in the second period, we are not in such a simple situation because we can't use the early adopters as a control anymore for the late adopters because the early adopters are on a path that may be affected by treatment. And we can't use the late adopters as a control for the early adopters because the late adopters may be on a path that can be affected by treatment. And so in this case, there is no way to learn without further restrictions anything about the dynamic effect of this policy. Okay, so to review for the early adopters, the late adopters are a valid control for the effect in the first period after adoption, just like before. I haven't changed the text at all, I think. If the trends diverge, it's because of the effect of adoption on the early adopters. But for the late adopters, the early adopters are not a valid control for the effect in the first period after adoption because the early adopters are now being dynamically affected by the policy in a way that we do not know and ideally would like to learn from the data but can't. And so if the trends diverge here, it could be because of the static effects of the policy on the late adopters, or it could be because of the dynamic effects of the policy on the early adopters, or some combination of the two, and we do not have a way to know from the data alone. Notice that um, if we knew that the effects were homogeneous but dynamic, so sort of semi-homogeneous in the sense they can vary with time from treatment but not across cohort, then we would be in a much better position. Why? Because in that situation, we would know that the effect of treatment on the, of the policy on the late adopters has to be, on average, the same as the effect it had on the early adopters. And the effect on the early adopters can be learned from this, this period here. So we could take the, period, the effect for the early adopters, which seems to be positive, and we could impute it for the late adopters and say, well, the late adopters, their outcome declines here. But it would have declined even more if it hadn't been for the positive effect of this policy on the outcome. And therefore, we know that the path that the early adopters would have taken would have looked like this, okay, as I've drawn it here. Okay, so if we knew that the effect was the same in both of these cohorts, both of these groups, then we could still find a valid counterfactual for the early adopters and learn the dynamic effects of the policy in the second period following adoption. Okay, so the, com it's the, the uh, issue that we were having before is not just about dynamics and it's not just about heterogeneity, it's about the combination of the two because it's a kind of rich heterogeneity in the effects that means that we may not be able to learn everything that we want without further restrictions. Okay, so what does this tell us about the use of parallel trends and no anticipation assumptions for identification in these settings? 
if we're not prepared to make any restriction on the dynamics of the effects, so we don't, for example, we aren't prepared to say that they're static, and we're not prepared to make any restriction on the heterogeneity of the effects, for example, we're not prepared to assume that the effects will be the same or very similar across adoption groups, then for every average effect we want to learn, just following the original difference in differences logic from Cart and Kruger that Sophie summarized earlier, we're going to need a group that is either unaffected by treatment or not yet affected by treatment, and that is measured simultaneously with the treated group that we are like looking to learn about. And that's it. We're going to need those things in order to apply the identifying assumptions that uh, Sophie uh, described. So I'm now going to talk about some approaches we can take if we want to allow for this type of heterogeneity. But importantly, no approach to estimation can solve problems with identification. Solving problems with identification requires either assumptions or the appropriate data or both. And so if we are not in these situations, there's not an estimator you can use that fixes that problem and no software you can download that will get you something that has the interpretation you're looking for. So just want to make that clear as we transition from talking about identification to talking about estimation, that using the right estimator only solves the problem if you are in a situation where the effects you're interested in are identified. So I'm gonna talk now about how you can address these issues in a situation of staggered adoption. And that is a situation that has been most heavily studied and it's the one on which the recent methodological literature has made the most progress. And then I'll talk a little bit about what can be said in other situations. So I'm gonna go back to the regression representation to give you some intuition for ways to solve these problems. And I'm going to remind you that we have an outcome Y, a unit fixed effect alpha, time fixed effect gamma, and an indicator for whether this unit I is post treatment that's given by Z. And then when we take first differences of Z, we're calculating indicators that tell us whether treatment occurred, treatment began for this unit I at a given time T minus K, so relative time compared to time T, just like before. And we're interested in learning these cumulative dynamic treatment effects, these deltas. I'm going to complicate this by imagining that the correct model has an I subscript on all the deltas. So every unit is allowed to have its own unit specific treatment path. So every restaurant is allowed to have its own dynamic effect of the minimum wage on employment at that restaurant. If we really want to make statements about individual uh uh effects that is going to be really hard um but there are case special cases in which we can say very useful things about average effects and one of the cases where that is possible in a fair amount of generality if we're in this situation is the case of staggered adoption in the case of staggered adoption the uh uh, full path of the treatment this is very important and this is in some sense the essence of the uh, underlying issues, the full path of Z can be described by one number, which is in what period does this unit adopt the policy, right? Because under staggered adoption, policy starts off off and then goes to on and stays on forever. So if I tell you when it turned on, you can draw the entire path of Z, right? So under staggered adoption, the entire dynamic history of Z can be summarized by this single thing, G. So we can group units according to their group G and every unit that shares the same G as another unit must have that other unit's treatment path, policy path. That is very important because it means, and I won't go through the details of why, that um, uh, it is sufficient in that situation to consider this restrictive model. Sort of, if we're interested in averages, it is without loss to consider this restrictive model. Because, and intuitively, and again, I won't go through the details, the reason is that all of the relationship between which unit this is and what treatment path it has comes through this object G. So in this restriction on the preceding model, I've replaced the unit specific if dynamic uh, treatment effects with group specific dynamic treatment effects. And the reason that this representation is very helpful and the intuition for why once we can get to this representation, we know that we're going to be able to uh, apply some very practical approaches to estimation is that this is an interacted regression model. 
So how would I estimate this model? I would just interact these delta Zs with indicators for whether this is group one, group two, group three, group four, and so on. So to estimate this model, I only need to take the model I was estimating before when I was not worrying about heterogeneity or where I had only a single uh, group because treatment turned on at the same time for every treated unit and just take that model and interact the, these uh, uh, delta Zs, these uh, uh, treatment variables with indicators for, is this a unit that adopts in period one? Is this a unit that adopts in period two? Is this a unit that adopts in period three and so on? And then just like I said in those earlier plots, once I've estimated those interacted, that interacted model, I have a group specific dynamic treatment path. Maybe I'd like to summarize that in some way to, so that I can make a picture of it or draw a numerical conclusion. Well, I can average those. So I can take an average of the treatment paths across the different cohorts and make my picture that way. And that is uh, totally fine. And it will get you a weighted average treatment effect under the no anticipation and parallel trends assumptions. Conveniently, that approach is implemented in a readily available software that I've listed here and other related approaches that have been developed in other papers that have appeared in this literature in recent years are also implemented in very convenient software that in my experience works quite well. Um, and uh, this is a subset of all the software that's available. There's a GitHub page that uh, Sophie found at some point that lists all of the software options in this space. And it goes to multiple pages, uh, multiple screen pages. So we decided not to list all of them. These are the ones that are listed in this uh, recent uh, set of review articles. But uh, uh, these packages implement the interaction regression approach that I just discussed. These packages, what they do is use only the pretreatment periods to estimate the time effects. So basically use only untreated units to estimate the gamma Ts. And then do and then subtract off the time effects to get the effects on the other units. These packages are basically taking individual difference and difference estimators and averaging them in a particular way. All of these packages are designed to estimate uh, weighted average effects on in staggered in cases of staggered adoption under situations like the one we've been describing, where there's unrestricted heterogeneity in the dynamic effect of the policy on the outcome. So all of these are pretty uh, uh, straightforward to use. And this is a great uh, type of sensitivity analysis that you can do right off the shelf if you're in a staggered adoption situation and you're interested in allowing for heterogeneity of the kind that I have uh, mentioned. Um, and these packages are supported by a number of scholarly articles, which I am uh, uh, listing here. People can, these slides are clickable, so folks can click on these and read um, about the details and underlying uh, econometric guarantees that come with these different estimators. Um, the, so a, a takeaway lesson that I would have is either make a case for restricting the heterogeneity or the dynamics in your setting based on economics or some other kind of a priori logic, which is always great. You can use economic theory or knowledge of the context to impose some structure that you think is defensible, I think that's a great thing to do. Or adopt some of these other approaches that I've mentioned, or both, you know, argue for your assumption and then as sensitivity analysis, show what happens to your estimates if you adopt some of these other um, off the shelf um, estimators. I wanna spend just a little bit of time on what happens if you don't do that. And so you don't have a situation where it makes sense to restrict heterogeneity, and you don't investigate what happens when you use estimators that are designed to allow for such heterogeneity. I'm not going to spend too long on this because I don't think there's a really a good reason to be in this situation, given that there are off the shelf tools that will work uh, well in situations with heterogeneity. But if you were to find yourself in this situation, you might like to know where you may have gone wrong. And so I'll briefly discuss. So suppose that you were to estimate this restrictive model that imposes that the effective treatment is identical for all units I, when in fact the correct model is one that say, says that the uh, dynamic effect of treatment, the dynamic effect of the policy may differ by group. What will happen? Well, one way to see where you're likely to start going wrong is to go back to the picture that we saw before. In this model that we specified here, it is totally fine and correct 
to use the behavior of the early adopt the behavior of the late adopters, the outcome, the evolution of the outcome for the late adopters in this period here to construct a counterfactual for what would have happened to the early adopters had it not been for the dynamic effect of treatment. And if that is a correct assumption, then the estimator will give you a correct answer. But if that is not a correct assumption, then the estimator may not give you a correct answer. You might ask, how different might the answer be? And you can see immediately from this plot that the answer is arbitrarily different because there is no information in the data under this model. There is no information in the data about the parameter we wanna know here. And so your estimator can be arbitrarily far away from the truth. It is very easy to show that because you're trying to estimate something that is not identified. So uh, uh, if you're estimating something that's totally unidentified, I can find a very bad data generating process under which your estimator can be very, very far from the thing you are trying to estimate. So all of this is to say that estimating this more restrictive model is fine if the restrictive model is a good approximation to the economic situation and not fine if it's not. And in fact, similar to, and you can see immediately why this is true, similar to the situation that Sophie mentioned earlier with the static model, the path that you estimate may not even be a weighted average of the underlying effects. And you can see why you're trying to estimate something that you cannot. So uh, uh, you may be very far from the truth. You might estimate something that is larger or smaller than all of the true effects. That seems undesirable. So just to say again, if you're in a situation with staggered adoption, I recommend to uh, make a case that you can restrict the dynamics or the heterogeneity of the effect of the policy based on economics or knowledge of the context, or use an estimator that leverages an untreated control of the kind that we have discussed, or both. Make the case based on economics and then maybe show some sensitivity analysis to relaxing that assumption. I think that would be a very reasonable approach. I want to spend a few minutes on what happens when we're not in a situation of staggered adoption. I'm not going to go into this into as much detail about this because there are fewer off the shelf solutions in this case. And what I'll try to do is give you a little bit of a flavor of why that is. Um, so uh, this is an extra challenging setting um, because uh, uh, once we go outside staggered adoption to the wide world of possible kinds of treatment of policy dynamics, we enter situations like continuous treatment and multiple treatment where it can be very difficult to define a pure control group. So for example, if the, the treatment that we're interested in is the level of the minimum wage, and we think that the level of the minimum wage can have arbitrary dynamic effects, well, the minimum wage was adopted in the United States decades ago. Every place is treated by it to some extent. And uh, so if we have a continuous treatment and a continuously evolving dynamic effect of that treatment, it's going to be very difficult to find totally untreated units from which we can make inferences. We're going to need to adopt restrictions. And the more complex the behavior of the policy is, the more restrictive we're likely to need to be to be able to make useful statements based on the data. Let me give you one example that, um, that Sophie and I have looked at in a paper that we wrote that I think is helpful for understanding why things can become complicated where we when we have, for example, continuous treatment and no untreated units, um, which is often the case when we have continuous treatment. So this is an example that's like a stylized example based on a paper by Amy Finkelstein about the effect of Medicare. I'm gonna strip away a lot of the, the real economic detail of that paper and take you down to a cartoon version of the paper. So the cartoon version of the paper is, Medicare is adopted in the United States, it's a national policy. So for the elderly, for old people, Medicare immediately introduces universal insurance. And so it, in it increases the share of older Americans who are insured everywhere in the United States. Because wherever the state, a given, uh, whatever, wherever you are, if the share of uh, older people that was insured in your state was 60% before Medicare, it goes to 100% immediately after Medicare. So every place in the country is affected by Medicare, but some places are more affected than others. Because if you're in a state that has a high insurance rate for older people prior to adoption of Medicare, then maybe you had 80% coverage before Medicare and Medicare is taking you from 80% to 100%. Whereas if you're in a state with low insurance penetration among older people, 
before the adoption of Medicare, then maybe you had a, a insurance penetration of 40% and Medicare is taking you from 40% all the way to 100%. And that seems like a much bigger change. The question is, what can we say about the effect of Medicare in a situation like this if we're not prepared to restrict the way in, to the restrict the extent to which the effect of Medicare may differ, say, across US states? Because it might be that the effect of Medicare on something like healthcare utilization or health is different in different places. Okay, so just to give you a stylized version of this situation, we are in a situation where there's a group, there's no control group, no untreated group. There's a group that's subjected to a small treatment and a group that's subjected to a large treatment. So this might be states where insurance penetration was low and states where insurance penetration was high. And we're interested in the effect on some outcome like healthcare utilization or the level of health or well being of older people. And the, our, we have a pre period, and then we observe some divergence between these two groups during the period in which the policy is adopted. So say as we adopt Medicare in 1965. If we're not prepared to restrict the effect of Medicare on the outcome variable in uh, uh, these different uh, groups, what can we say about the effect of Medicare on the outcome? I'm gonna run a little poll in the room. I won't run this on Zoom. So I'm just gonna, I'll report the results through the microphone. So how many people think that the treatment had a positive effect on the outcome? How many people think that the treatment had a negative effect on the outcome? Okay, so there were a few votes for positive, no votes for negative. How many people think we can't say? Okay, similar number of votes for we can't say to for positive, and indeed we can't say. Um, why? Because it could be, and this is, I think, the nat maybe a natural inference and might be very reasonable under further assumptions, that what would have happened absent the adoption of this policy would look like this. So maybe the, the counterfactual for the uh, small treatment group would look like this. Maybe there would have been a small decline. And so what we're seeing is that treatment increases the outcome variable and it increases in more for more treated units. Right? So this is what you'd get, for example, if you thought that the effective treatment was fairly proportional to the size of the treatment. So that the effect of Medicare on health is larger in places where Medicare has a larger effect on insurance penetration and smaller in, in, in places where Medicare has a smaller effect on insurance penetration. And that may, by the way, be a very reasonable economic assumption. But if you're not prepared to make that assumption and you don't know, and you're totally agnostic about the way that Medicare may affect different states. And so it might be that Medicare has, you know, much different effects on some groups of states than others for all kinds of reasons having not to do with their insurance penetration. Then you can't refute this possibility, which is that absent Medicare, health would have improved like this. And so what we're seeing is a small effect on the largely treated states and a large effect on the slightly treated states because maybe these states are just different and they're less affected by insurance because of the way the health of the underlying population or some other difference between these states and these states. And so, in fact, in a situation like this, unless if you, if you, even if you have parallel trends and no anticipation or the analogs of those for this type of setting, unless you're prepared to make some restriction on the way the treatment effect differs across units, you cannot estimate any average effect. In fact, Sophie and I, in our paper, in an appendix, we showed that there, for, for, there is no estimator that is guaranteed to be contained between the largest and smallest of the effects for the different units. So any estimator you pick, I can find a possible distribution of underlying effects that lies completely above or completely below your estimate. And the proof in the appendix of the paper goes through exactly how one does that construction. So we're going to need some additional information, either additional data or additional assumptions or both. So in a situation, if you find yourself in this situation, and here I have fewer software packages to recommend because this situation, this type of situation is more delicate and more accustomed to your economic setting, I would again recommend using economics to restrict the dynamics of treatment effects, restrict their heterogeneity, or maybe restrict their functional form. So for example, proportionality here would buy you a lot, or to use an estimator that leverages an untreated control. 
And in this situation, if we had, you know, another a state that was exempt from Medicare, or maybe we have Canada or, you know, some other control unit that is not affected by the treatment, then we would be able to disambiguate the two situations, assuming we believe parallel trends and no anticipation holds, because we would know that both types of both of these types of units had benefited or have seen their outcome improve as or increase as a result of Medicare with a larger increase for the more treated unit than for the less treated unit. So having an untreated control would be very useful in situations like this. And the literature has dealt with that type of situation where you are in possession of an untreated control and are therefore able to construct uh, uh, valid estimates of weighted average uh, treatment effects. And with that, I will, I guess, pause for questions before turning it back over to Sophie one last time. Afternoon. Um, this is the last module, and I'm just going to provide a, a quick summary for takeaways take based on what we have discussed so far. So in the uh, identification module, we started with the basic uh, difference in differences estimator for two periods and two groups and reviewed the usual uh, assumptions that are uh, used to justify the DID estimator estimates the causal effect. And uh, to extend to settings beyond um, two periods, two groups, to multiple treatment, uh, multiple periods and multiple groups, we also need to generalize these assumptions uh, appropriately. Um, we emphasize that the parallel trans assumption is not invariant to scale. And in particular, in the generalization to uh, multiple periods and multiple groups, uh, the commonly used uh, two effects of specifications sometimes are uh, not flexible enough, so would need additional uh, restrictions in addition to these assumptions for us to estimate the treatment effect. For example, they may uh, impose restrictions uh, such as static or homogeneous treatment effect. And in practice, we don't know if these restrictions are um, correct, so we might not want to rely only on the restricted specifications to draw conclusions. So, for example, only estimate the static specification to estimate the overall effect when there could be dynamics. Um, in the plotting module, um, we discussed how we can easily make event study plots after we estimate the dynamic specification, and we argue that this should be an essential part of our analysis because uh, plotting makes it very explicit to what normalization we are imposing. Um, there are other things we can add to the plots to make them more um, informative. So, for example, since we're depicting the whole path of the treatment effect, we might want to also see what other paths are uh, consistent with the data. So, therefore, we can add the uniform confidence spans to do that. We can also add um, p-values for key tests in event studies, for example, the zero trend test and um, the test for whether the dynamic effects have, level have leveled off. Um, in the module of uh, confounding and pre-trend testing, um, we cover the basis of pre-trend tests and discussed when we have rejection of the zero pre-trend hypothesis. This is a situation that usually will need additional interpretation because we cannot separate violations of no anticipation from violations of parallel trans assumption only based on the data. Now, um, suppose we're going to uh, interpret the pre-trend test as a test for a power trend assumption. Um, there are recent um, literature that have discovered some issues with these practice. For example, these pre-trend tests can have low power against um, alternatives under reasonable extrapolation would imply confounding bias for our post-treatment effect estimates. And uh, if we further uh, screen based on these low power tests, there is a high chance we can pass them even when there is indeed confounding. And this could uh, exacerbate the bias, which is referred to as pretest bias in econometrics. So the bottom line here is that we might not want to emphasize pre-trend tests when the power is low. Instead, we can consider some um, alternative solutions that would allow for violations of power trends. In the last module, um, we discussed um, the impact of heterogeneous effects across multiple treatment groups on how we might do estimation. So um, this is in, sometimes implicitly assumed away by uh, two-way face-effect specifications that are not flexible in, uh, enough. 
And um, we discussed uh, in order to even identify the average effects, uh, usually we would need one or both of restrictions on heterogeneity or dynamics of effects or uh, use uh, new and flexible methods uh, that, lever that leverages untreated or not yet treated groups. And there are many good solutions for a stagger adoption case, but uh, fewer generic solutions outside of stagger adoption. Um, so thank you so much for uh, participating for those both on Zoom and um, in person. Thank you for the organizers for proposing the theme and to all the researchers and practitioners that have worked on and used these methods that give us the opportunity to put together the material. Thanks.